CBAN East Midlands is the contemporary visual art network for the East Midlands region. This encompasses Derbyshire, Leicestershire, Lincolnshire, Northamptonshire, Nottinghamshire and Rutland. We work alongside the national team and eight other regional networks to amplify voices, debate and democratic change across the sector. Our strength lies in our network. We celebrate and support arts and culture in the region, working to champion artists and foster an inclusive long-term future for the sector. CBAN East Midlands is a catalyst for conversation and collaborate, a collaborative action, emphasising equity and access for all arts workers. I'm supporting my role by a growing steering group made up of representatives from regional organisations and artists working across the East Midlands. And now to introduce to tonight's speaker, who is Julie Lomax, who you can see on your screen. Julie is Chief Executive Officer of AN, the Artist Information Company, the largest artist membership organisation in the UK. Julie will speak about AN's crucial work around fair pay for artists. Julie will cover the Paying Artists Campaign, which was launched in 2014, to secure payment for artists who exhibit in publicly funded galleries and will share ongoing developments around AN's payment guide, exhibition payment guide, sorry, first launched in 2016. Following a presentation by Julie, we will open the floor to questions and discussion, prompting learning, advocacy and action around best practice and positive change within the region sector. And now to hand over to Julie, thank you. Thank you, and thank you everybody for joining this evening. I believe it's a, a busy, busy night in Nottingham, so I feel uh, very privileged that you've um, come to hear me talk about AN's work. I am a white female with long blonde hair, and I've got a grey jumper on. I may have to take it off though, because it's quite warm here in London um, this evening. Um, I'm going to kick off with a presentation. I'm also going to talk a little bit about AN and AN's history, because I think that's very important to where we are now and the kind of work that we do now. So do bear with me um, with those uh, early slides. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, so, um, Yes, I am the CEO of um, AN and I've actually been in role now for three years and when I first came into role um, there was a, we, we had done a very successful paying artists campaign and also um, uh, had the exhibition payment guide um, but we're now in the point where we're reviewing that and refreshing that work. So as I said I'll do an introduction to AN then talk very specifically about the Paying Artists campaign and then how artists can act as leaders um, within their communities. So we are 40 this year, that's our 40th um, anniversary logo. In fact, at the end of this month, we turn 41. So um, yeah, we've had a great year actually celebrating our 40th and I'm going to show you some of the ways that we also celebrated our 40th because that's part of our DNA. Uh, Maria Hatling um, designed that logo for us and I think what's really important um, about this is as you can see she has a painting practice and she developed this logo and we actually ensure that all the money um, that gets paid to us through um, membership subscriptions is also invested back into artists and into our members and so we do call outs for our work um, to our membership. So as you can see here, um, on the left there is uh, the very first edition of Artist Newsletter. And then in 1981, we introduced images. And Artist Newsletter was actually set up by a group of artists in Sunderland. And um, they were asked to provide an information services service for artists um, in the Northeast by then what would have been the Northeast Arts Board. And they said, we'd really like to do this, but we'd like to do something that is UK wide and Artist Newsletter um, came out of that. And the original mission for Artist Newsletter was in support of the artist. And that's something that stayed with us throughout all the different um, ways that the business has developed over the 40 years. I used to get artist newsletters, so I got I start I would have started to engage with, with artist newsletter around 1981, probably September 1981, 
because that's when I went to do my foundation. Um, well, it was an intermediate actually at Rochdale Art College. And um, this was always in the library. And also when I went on to do my BA at Chelsea Art School, uh, AN was artist newsletter was always in the library and it was the play it was the it was the actual magazine that you went to to find opportunities to know what was going on at a grassroots level etc and it was always the dirtiest um, uh, um, magazine in the library because of course everybody um, used to go in and pick it up and so it was always a little bit grubby with you know I don't know, like printing ink and all kinds of bits of, you know, oil paint and things on it, um, but very useful. And in fact, when I left college, I got my first studio and my first residency through Artist Newsletter through the classifieds. So um, we hope that we've taken that DNA forward in uh, what we do today. Um, in the, we've just, as I've said, we've been having our 40th anniversary year. And what we did is we actually commissioned um, some uh, actual anniversary editions of Artist Newsletter and we took them in decades. So um, this was the first decade. So the 80s and Black Hole Club um, did an amazing um, newsletter for us. Now, all four newsletters are now up on our website. So they're digital rather than print versions. And I would urge you to go and have a look at them because they um, have used some of that, um, the anniversary, the, the archive, um, but also brought it really up to date with the things that artists are interested in now. So we also did something called 40 Years 40 Artists. So we went back into the archive as well and interviewed artists whose work and uh, we'd featured in um, AN. And I think what was interesting about um, Artists Newsletter is it featured artists that were not able to get any kind of recognition for their work in the mainstream art press at the time. And so on the left there, you've got Magdalena Adundo, um, and on the right there, um, Mona Hartu. Mona's doing a performance there in Brixton. And um, these are some of the quotes. Uh, so AN was important in helping dispel the distinction made between art and craft. Um, things were very siloed in those days. And actually, AN has been brilliant to not silo over the years. And, in some of the early editions of Artist Newsletter, there would be a supplement called Clay, 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 and it's just brilliant. I love it. And in fact, um, I've just been asked for those for a particular exhibition in a very big um, uh, art gallery in London that's coming up in the next year. And as you can see there, Mona Hartum has said, I used to wait, I used to impatiently wait for the magazine to come out and then spend a few days putting together proposals for any exhibitions calling for submissions. I also think it's important, you know, to understand that everybody starts somewhere and, you know, that's where Mona Hartum started out. Um, also here we interviewed Sunil Gupta, uh, Richard Wilson and Anne Bean, uh, top right, that's uh, an image of them in the Bo Gamelin, um, which was a, a, a collective that they found. Um, and then there's Shyla Berman. And as you can see here, some more quotes. I saw art production as kind of politics. And there you've got what Shyla's saying here, you know, that AM was very aware of race, class, gender, and issues of cultural diversity. It felt like one of the only magazines we had to guide or support us or advertise our exhibitions. Um, so we also interviewed um, in the 80s Liz Rhodes, uh, Anthony Gormley there, bottom right, and Brian Catling. Brian Catling actually used to teach me at Chelsea. And then we brought it right up to date and interviewed uh, graduates in 2020, um, who of course had had a very different experience of graduating um, from university. So we've got Mia Brown there on the right, Jodie Mulvey, bottom left, and then top, the uh, top left is um, an image there of uh, Keith Piper and Eddie Chambers, and um, Keith actually is on our board now, um, and that has come through the fact that we supported Keith and his work in those early days, so we're very lucky to have him on the board, it's, it's great. 
And here are a couple of quotes from Jodie and Mia. So I believe that although the role of an artist is predominantly as a maker of an output, they also have roles within their community to hold institutions accountable, be advocates for inclusive practices and support their peers. And um, Mia has said that the future is green, multiracial and fluid. So we use the anniversary not just to look back, but also to look forward, you know, what is the role of the artist today? And then also how can we support um, artists now? Um, so I'm now to talk a little bit about um, AN and what we actually do. So we're the largest artist membership organization in the UK. So we've got over 24,000 members um, and that we've seen a big pickup in the last few months and that's, you know, we, we inevitably, there was a drop off last year, there was no work, you know, why would you pay a membership for services if you can't work? Um, but that is picking up. So we're really happy about that. We're an artist support organization and um, where we differ. So a lot of people ask me, why are you not a union or are you a union? Are you like a union? And uh, we work um, closely with Artists Union England and the Scottish Artists Union. They've, they've been part of, you know, panels, research, you know, the work that we do. And the differences between us and a union is we provide services around professional development. So we provide services about being the business of being an artist, but also your creative practice. What a union does is um, can go in and represent. So if you're in dispute in the workplace, a union can go in and represent you. We wouldn't do that. What we do have, though, is a legal and tax helpline. So you can call the legal helpline if you've got issues with contracts or anything happening in the workplace. Um, but representation is done by the union. And so that's that's really the kind of, that's a very basic uh, way of saying the difference between AN and Artists Union England and Scottish Artists Union. <laughs> um, we run an annual programme supporting artist professional development. We conduct research to evidence the value and needs of artists, and we advocate on behalf of our members and, and the art sector to improve artists' livelihoods. And so that's obviously where our paying artists uh, work comes out of. What is little known, and I'd like it to be a bit more well known, is we are part of, so we're the UK representative for the International Arts Association. Um, at the IAA. And the IAA was formed in 1952 under the chairmanship of artist Gino Severini and is an artist led global network. It's affiliated um, to UNESCO and has consultative status. And it facilitates international cooperation among artists and improves their economic and social position as well as defending their material and moral rights. And so we do have a direct line to UNESCO. And uh, that's very important. And we're very, very active in the IAA Europe. And in fact, tomorrow morning, we do have um, a symposium. It is actually booked out, but we will have it online afterwards. We have a symposium that we're doing with the Finnish Artists Association, who are the, like the equivalent of AN only in Finland. Um, which is a symposium around fair pay for artists. And we have fielded speakers such as Jane and Louise Wilson, because obviously, you know, as a duo, you know, getting paid um, has, you know, has presented, you know, challenges, shall we say, for institutions when they're paid, you know, because they're seen as like one artist, even though they're two, because there's one output from that. Um, but also we fielded wage in America um, and they'll be doing a talk at the symposium. Um, I have to get up very early, actually. I've got to be, I've got to be speaking, I think, at eight o'clock. Um, so I've got to be tuned in by 7.30. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's really important that we're part of this global network and that we can facilitate that. Um, and also that we can ask questions and we can get statutes written through UNESCO's work. So what do we provide um, for our um, artists membership? Um, public and products liability and professional indemnity insurance. We increased that last year to 10 million because we 
uh, realised that that was being asked by a lot of um, different employers, especially if you get work with local authorities. We've added legal and tax uh, helpline. Uh, we still do the jobs and opportunities, just like when I got there, I used to go in the library or when Mona Hartoum used to get her copy of Artist Newsletter. We still do that, those listings. Uh, the IAA card. So the IAA card is an international card which operates a bit like an ICOM card and it lets you in free into um, museums and galleries. Obviously, in this country, most museums and galleries are free, but what we are going to do is some negotiation with that card to see if we can get artists um, into paying shows as well. Uh, we have our annual artist bursary program. Um, we do mentoring and coaching, talks and events. And um, prior to COVID, um, we did do international delegations. And that top right image is actually an image of a delegation that we did uh, with no artists from the Northwest um, going to Denmark because the, the, um, Manchester and Aarhus are uh, twinned at the moment. We send out, um, we don't have an artist newsletter anymore, but we do send out a monthly mailing. I quite like to call it artist newsletter again, but it doesn't quite have the same information as artist newsletter. And as I said, we do talks and events. So one of the most important things that I think we do is we're able to link artists and create community for artists because it's very important when you leave college or wherever you move to or wherever you're working that you feel like you've got community and actually places like primary and um, backlit, you know, they're creating community as well and artists run spaces. So we run a program called assembly. We have assembly happening next week. It's had to go online digital, um, but we're running that with Abingdon studios in um, Blackpool. And then on the top right, that's an image from a talk that we did. Um, where we had a number of uh, women artists talking about their careers and um, how you actually manage that gap that you might take, because as we know, women are still doing, are still the main carers, whether that's for relatives or, or children, et cetera. Um, so that was called Mind the Gap. Um, and it was a really great event. Sadly, it wasn't recorded. Um, so unfortunately, we don't have a recording of the event. Um, we have partnerships with universities. I've been told today that that's actually gone up to 61. So I should have changed that. Um, we, so we have partnerships with 61 universities and colleges and we do the degree show um, a guide. Um, and what is very important about that is it, it gives um, uh, students a kind of a first showcase really and being written about and their work being written about. Um, and also um, one of the things um, with Jody, who's now on our artist council and did the 40 years 40 artists, I actually found her through the sad grads Instagram account. Um, so very much relating to that 2020 situation where um, all of the degree shows had to pivot online. We do research campaigns and advocacy. Um, so our big piece of research that we uh, do, and we're committed to do it every five years, so we'll be launching it next year, is the Artist Livelihoods Research. Um, obviously, I'm going to talk in more depth about the Paying Artists campaign, but we also work in partnership with CVAN through the Visual Arts Alliance, DAX, we've been working on them with them on a manifesto for artists. And we also attend many government uh, working groups and uh, the Creative Industries Federation. Um, this was a very important piece of work that we did last year. Um, we went very early surveying um, artists, but what actually happened with that survey? So, I mean, one of the things that I'd like to talk about in terms of advocacy is when you're doing advocacy, it's always great to have a takeaway of this type of research, you know, 93% reported that, you know, it had an effect on practice and career. And, um, you know, 96% immediate impact on their income. I had one of my artist council members contact me and said he lost eight grand's worth of work overnight. And whilst eight grand might not seem a lot, if you times that by 
you know, 24,000 members, that's a lot of, lot of money loss, um, and work cancelled. So we, we saw what happened last year, um, and I know that it's starting to come back. But actually, what we need to do is ensure that the bad practices don't come back. Because what I was able to do, oh, yeah, so this is just saying really about, you know, the artists have long been asked to navigate and shapeshift through a complex set of structures, relationships and arrangements. And what starts in the studio is mostly is creative practices reliant on a thriving visual arts sector. Um, so we saw what was happening last year and what we were able to do is to negotiate funding so we distributed two million pounds in funds to artists and freelancers working in visual arts we made over a thousand grants and we also um, helped the art technicians fund um, who raised money to actually make grants as well because we're able to do that because we've got the systems in place what i should say from those heartbreaking 7,145 applications, we really saw the level of bad practice has crept back into the sector. Um, there was one application which was for um, uh, an artist who had had a residency um, cancelled in a publicly funded organisation and the residency was publicly funded and the Hamlin Foundation had actually funded the residency and the Hamlin Foundation went out with a message saying that, you know, uh, that organisations could, you know, use the money and they weren't expecting outputs. And yet the person that didn't get paid in that in that circle was the artist that should have been doing that residency. And I can tell you now it's major institution that is in the Midlands, um, but I won't name names, but we saw the stories and it was actually quite shocking. So it made me realise as well, uh, I read pretty much all of those 7,000 applications. The only batch that I didn't read was when I was on my way back from New Zealand, because I actually got stuck in New Zealand under lockdown for four months last year. So yes, yeah, so we saw the stories, we could see the bad practice that has crept back into the sector and we're very aware of it. Um, what we were able to do as well though, as I've said, you know, with any advocacy, it starts with those hard facts. And so we were able then to do a number of actions. And I would hope that actually our letter to the treasury um, calling for support for self-employed actually then was a, a small part of the Treasury then, you know, coming out with the size, uh, which wasn't perfect, as we know. But what we also found is there are some issues with, um, with, 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 with the way that the arts is structured anyway and those business models. So trading, self-employed earnings versus expensive expenses recently self-employed and also parental implications for people who are um, self-employed or running their own businesses. And so I just want to finish this section on um, a piece of work that Kevin Hunt did, and this is publicly available. And he attended um, an event that um, AM was partnering on with low profile called Jamboree. And he made a promise to himself that he would document every um every approach for employment over um a year's period and that document is actually extraordinary how many times he wasn't offered a contract whether he was put on payroll or not put on payroll um, and it's a real eye, eye opener and again you know helps us think through you know how do we want to advocate how do we want to take paying artists uh, forward and you know there's a real like wholesale misinterpretation of the IR35 rules. Now I could do a whole talk on IR35, but I won't do that now. Um, and so these are the things that have come to light throughout this, throughout the pandemic, but there are also things that we need to um, look at now. So I'm going to talk now about the Paying Artists campaign, but I'm going to just briefly stop in case anybody has any questions about AN, our history, anything like that. Um, if anyone's got a question, I can't see hands at the minute because we're on the share screen. So please just um, unmute yourself and um, 
ask a question or, or drop it in the chat before we move on. Thank you. Yeah, just quickly having a scan of chat. Yeah, okay, great. So I'm going to talk very specifically about the Paying Artist campaign now. Um, so in what I should show you actually, which is very interesting, is this is a document um, about a council. And in fact, the, the talk about um, doing something around um, paying artists and the first survey that was ever done um, for about evidence of need and of artists and their aspirations was actually in 2005. So there's a, there's a timeline here, which I must get typed up into slides because it's really interesting. And then also we've been doing um, artist fees and payment guides. This one is 2006, seven, but we were doing it previously because this is an updated one. Um, and so it is again, something that we've been doing for longer than this 2014 research. And we will have to continue to do it. You know, it doesn't resolve itself. If anything, it needs to be a much more dynamic thing that continues you know it's a continuous piece of work so just to, just to say if you do get that typed up or scanned in it would be great to have to to share just obviously comments in the chat about obviously it's difficult to see um things held up to the camera but oh yeah yeah Thank yeah you. that's good I, I will get it scanned actually and sent because i think this is a really great document i found it obviously when we were rifling through the archive for 40 years 40 artists last year so I found some really um, brilliant older documents. I always think, you know, it's, if you go back in the archive, it really gives you a sense of the organization. And I always think it's maybe a bit like a fashion designer when they go back in the archive and bring bits forward, you know, that they, you know, but they, but they kind of modernize them for, you know, what people want to wear now. Um, that was a bit of frivolous analogy. Now we're going to talk about a very serious subject. So, yes, yeah, so in 2014, we conducted some more research. And I'm going to say more research because clearly we've conducted research previously. And what we found is 71% of artists did not receive a fee for exhibiting in a publicly funded exhibition. And when we uh, and, and it's a very interesting example of this would be I'm going to the Turner Prize next week. Now, clearly, with the prize, there is a, a prize that somebody will be awarded. The exhibition is supported. Tate puts the exhibition on. But I actually brought up in a Twitter conversation um, um, that actually all of the artists should also receive a fee for the exhibition whether they win the prize or not. Um, and I'm, I am pleased to say that somebody very senior in, at Tate did get in touch with me for our exhibition payment guide, even though they could just downloaded it from um, our website. So it's clear that we also need to do some more work um, with um, the institutions to tell them that this resource is available as well. So. 71% of artists did not receive a fee for exhibiting in a publicly funded exhibition. And that actually was the catalyst really for the Paying Artists campaign. And some of you may know an artist called Emily Speed. She, as in a similar way to Kevin, documenting that year of how do you want to employ me, she had been blogging on the AN uh, website about all the incidences where she was offered work but with no pay and again that actually you know formed like the back bone to the paying artist campaign and, and actually Emily was on our artist council at the time and on our board so further research and consultation was done and also um uh, lots of interviews to gain sector support, because at this point with the Paying Artists campaign, it was really important to be able to get the sector on side, not just to say, OK, artists need to get paid, actually to, to talk to them and say, why are you not paying artists? But, but in a way that actually brings them with the campaign, as opposed to kind of saying you're not paying artists, you're, you know, bad sector. Um, 
And so this is one of the events up and down the country. Um, so this is one of the events um, that happened at Spike Island, an image of it. And obviously we produced a lot of collateral for people to use, for people to share and be part of the game. And um, the basic kind of, um, I guess the aims of the campaign were to ensure that artists have an income stream to sustain their careers and to improve fairness, equality and diversity in the visual arts. Um, you know, because what happens if you don't get paid for doing an exhibition? It means that only certain people can ca actually engage. Um, and it's interesting to, because I know this from a different side, because I, I, I gave up practicing fairly early on. I think maybe I was two or three years out of art school and I gave up practicing. But where I experienced um, uh, barriers is I actually, I couldn't afford to work for free. So whilst I probably would have loved to have gone and worked in, you know, um, a nice, you know, commercial gallery in Cork Street, which, which there was only Cork Street at the time and a couple of like outliers, and there was no way I could afford to do that. So in fact, I took a very different career route, which was a paid career route. And so I, I get it, you know, that it's going to exclude uh, certain people. Um, and so the idea was that, you know, if artists could get paid, then actually there would be fairness, equality and diversity. Um, and so we put together the exhibition payment guide. And I should also say that what the research also found out that if artists were getting paid, often there were no contracts in place or where there was even a contract in place, they weren't getting paid on time. So they're we getting paid much later. And um, so it wasn't just the fact that piece of research doesn't just bring out the fact that artists are not getting paid it's all the other types of difficulties um, so we um, put together the exhibition payment guide and actually in our business plan we we are due to renew it in this financial year um, but I would say any document going forward needs to be much more dynamic than that because having it reviewed every four years it feels very, very out of date now. So the core principles of the exhibition payment guidance are transparency, budgeting, negotiation and written confirmation. And in some ways that looks really simple, doesn't it? You know, you have a conversation with an institution that wants to show your work. It's a transparent conversation. They tell you exactly, you, you know, what the budget is and then you negotiate and then you get written confirmation. Uh, I was talking to some students uh, last week and they were students that were doing an arts and business course. So they couldn't understand why people didn't get written confirmation or contracts. And this wasn't a slide that I showed them, but were the were what happens in the visual arts is this bit where the where the red blob transparency and the pink blob budgeting i described it to students last week is it's a bit like dating so the curator approaches you they're really interested in showing you your work but then what they have to do is they take it back to the institution and then they have to pitch it and so they're pitching it in a program meeting or something like that. So you're feeling like this dance is going ahead. You've had that first day or somebody's invited you on that first day. And then nobody's talked about money at this point because the curator doesn't really know what they can promise you or they promise you. And then actually, once you get to negotiation and written confirmation, it looks very different. And so there is this dance that goes on. So then they can firm it, say it gets into the program, then there's a budget for it. But often the budget is not confirmed because maybe the institution has to do some fundraising and sometimes, in some cases, asks you to do the fundraising because perhaps you can get a grant um, as an individual for the work that you're going to do for the institution. I've seen it all happen. I, you know, I've worked with many institutions. And so um, at this point, there is there's a kind of 
you're on a promise. So you feel like you're going to get that second or third day and you're going to secure it. But really, it's still very, very up in the air. And I think it's these two, the red and the pink, where it, it really needs to, we need to have better um, processes with institutions. And then the negotiation, it is what it is. It's a negotiation and what might have been promised or uh, talked about prior to that becomes something very different. You might have, as an artist, already started to think about the work, put your labour into that and your creativity into that. And then you've got to the negotiation and you think that you're producing something, for instance, for £10,000 and plus £5,000 um, fee. And then actually the whole thing is £10,000. You know you're not going you know, you to make that work because you want to make your best work and you want to show it and you end up without a fee and actually out of pocket because if you count every hour that you've spent up to this point, you are out of pocket. And then if you're lucky, you get the written conf confirmation. And quite often I've seen written confirmation go out after the exhibition has even started. And I know because I have actually done written confirmations close to the bone as well when I've been doing contracts. And, you know, Interestingly, those kind of dances around budget and transparency are, uh, can be, you know, quite heartbreaking. I mean, I had one of my artist council was asked to put a proposal into an institution, you know, a proposal for one of the buildings and then uh, gave them all the IP, did a site visit, didn't get paid any expenses for the site visit, had a, a day's site visit, paid the train, etc. And then the institution had an open call for that building and used some of that IP. Now, luckily, we have a legal and tax helpline now, but, you know, there was also that, that moment for that particular person when he called me to say, I really like this institution and I don't know whether I want to upset them, you know, so it really, I think, you know, the onus has to be put back on the institutions to behave properly, um, but obviously in, to empower you as artists to be able to use the payment framework, the toolkit and the contracts toolkit. So if you're not going to be offered a contract, you can say, here is my contract. And just before we started today, we had a, 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 a Colette and I had a, a, a very brief conversation about access riders. And I'm hoping that AN with Dash can actually do something about that. And, and I must admit, I didn't really know what an access rider was, but I knew what a rider was and I knew what access was. So I put the two together and then Colette gave me more information. But also, you know, your contracts can include things like an access rider or even in that transparency blob there. So it, the Paying Artists campaign and that toolkit, the exhibition payment guide, et cetera, was developed in consultation with the sector, Arts Council England, Creative Scotland and Arts Council Wales, and organisations who were applying for funding from 2017 were supposed to have the evidence and budget for fair payment to artists. It's very difficult to get this information. Essentially, I ought to be able to go to Arts Council England and find out very quickly from a spreadsheet how much has been paid to artists through the fact that organisations like myself, when we put in our annual submissions, have to say how many artists we've employed and the amount of money. It is quite hard, though, to get that information. And again, I would like, because how do you measure that people, that pay has gone up and more artists are getting work? You can only measure it through having that baseline information. And that's something that I'd like to talk to Arts Council about again, uh, not necessarily to change people's uh, uh, annual reporting, but also to just get that information out. I do know from when I was at Arts Council England, because I was there for nine and a half years, and didn't get very many complaints. Um, but if there was ever a complaint came in, you can bet your life it was because a curator 
had had a grant, a grants for the arts grant, and um, uh, for an exhibition, had applied for funding to pay artists and not paid them. And unfortunately, Arts Council England cannot get involved in what, what is called third party disputes. So again, that's why organisations like AN have got the legal and tax helpline. So um, the exhibition payment guidance um, was widely circulated. It's the framework that should be used when artist work is being presented to the public in exhibitions. And we also have guidance on fees and day rates, which can be used for other work and services. Um, and there's our commitment from Simon um, Arts Council England. Um, and so it, 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 it received all the endorsements that it needed to receive and all the commitments to it. And this was what our paying artist working group. Um, we also had an artist on the working group. Uh, Rachel McLean. We will be setting up another working group, but actually we will have a 50-50 split of artists and institutions, all these like umbrella bodies, because it was very, um, in the first instance, which it needed to be very institution heavy. But again, that's institutions talking to each other as opposed to artists saying to institutions or networks, this is, this is, you know, how, how I've been treated. And in fact, when we got to the point where we were publishing case studies, um, we had a couple of artists say, that was absolutely not my experience of that institution. And so again, some of the case studies we couldn't publish, which was a shame. So we've done a number of uh, focus groups and then the pandemic happened. And so we will pick this up again um, in the next six months, um, looking at all the other types of labor and, the, and different practices. So what we aim to come out with is not an exhibition payment guide, but an artist payment guide. So it will have all these other different categories in. Um, you know, how much you should be paid now when you're doing online exhibitions or when you're providing online content, this, you know, hybrid clearly is here to stay. Um, but also we are working more as well with like more grassroots. So we want it to be multifaceted, the information that feeds into the artist payment guide. So we've recently been working with um, industria around artist leaks and supporting their work but also support we're about to um, work with guild um, and east street arts around uh, documenting um, unpaid labor in artist-run spaces and um, studios and really that's to just highlight the fact that those types of organizations probably need more funding than they're getting through uh, grants. I'm so gonna expand the, what was called the Paying Artists Working Group and um, create an advocacy working group. Um, we will create an artist payment guide, which will be much more comprehensive. It will be a dynamic document. So rather than say, set a date in the business plan for it to be renewed actually for it to be a digital document that can be updated and renewed on an annual basis easily sent to key people and institutions rather than it was a printed guide you can download it though but also um develop a research framework because that didn't really happen last time uh, and put to collect data on artists payments but also to measure changes so to actually measure those changes within institutions julie just while we're um, on the topic we've just had a question come in um, do you feel that um, arts council can slash need to be more responsive uh, responsible sorry for the money they distribute to organizations creators producers etc to ensure the money is being distributed appropriately i think that is their role actually um, because I mean when I was at Arts Council you know um, one of the things that you would do on a, and well it was a three-year basis then would be to look at the applications that were coming in from institutions for you know MPO funding it wasn't MPO funding in those days it was called RFO funding it changed to MPO just as I was leaving 
Um, but yeah, I mean, the accountability has to lie through the monitoring um, because, you know, if an organization makes an application and says that it's going to pay artists, then, then you're monitoring that organization on an annual basis and also looking at their accounts. You ought to be able to, as a relationship manager, ask the question, have you been paying artists? Have you been using ANs, you know, guide, et cetera? So I do think um, there is an onus actually on the big funding bodies and not just um, the big public funding bodies, but perhaps trusts and foundations to, to do a bit more work, um, especially in visual arts and um, probably um, in literature as well. I mean, the only when we used to have the annual kind of um, data that would come in around, you know, who gets paid the least really annual, you know, um, uh, over a year, the only people that got paid less than the visual artists were the poets. Um, and so, you know, the, that they Arts Council has got all that data. And the reason I say very specifically around um, visual arts and also literature is that those are two sectors that are not properly unionized in the same way that the performing arts are, uh, you know, musicians union. And I'm not, and I know that not all of the sector is, you know, part of the musicians union or not all of, you know, not all actors are members of equity, but there is like a given there around the rates of pay that, that obviously if you're a theatre, you, you'd, be, you'd be very difficult for you to employ an actor and not pay them equity rates, even if they weren't a member of equity. So I do think there is a, a responsibility there to ask that question um, and make sure that the payments are right. One of those focus groups that we did, I had not, I, I hadn't, I just joined AN actually. And I worked out that one of the artists was talking about an education project that she'd done and the amount of hours that it had taken her and not just the hours to develop it, but the hours that she actually delivered it. And I did a quick calculation in my head and this was with a major institution, you know, not a small one, you know, multi-million pound, you know, turnover. And I said, actually that institution is in breach of minimum pay legislation. So they've act, actually acted against the law. So, you know, they broke the law, basically. So, um, but also I think that, you know, that's not the, uh, at the foremost in artists' minds when they get, when they play that dance, when they do that date, and they have that date with that institution or that curator, that actually is this institution going to pay me the minimum wage even? Um, and that quick calculation, she was able to go back and say, this doesn't work out as the minimum wage because she was partway through the project at the time. And I was like, whoa. Um, so yeah, so there are little things like that that we could have as part of our resource. This is the minimum wage. This is the living wage. You know. I think just while we're on that topic as well, thinking about, and like you say, scales um, in terms of living a minimum wage, you've got a question here about, um, yeah kind of wage around experience so a uh, question is should an emerging artist or upcoming artist be paid well I, I guess that the same as a more established artist in, in this instance um, or do they not deserve the worth of the money that they should generally be paying paid to artists either emerging or famous artists so again the difference I guess between um, yeah level of experience for artists and how that um, can or should or does or doesn't impact on the amounts that people are paid I don't know. Well, what I do know about the sector, because obviously I've worked in the sector for a very, very long time, is that artists uh, it, give it away at the top and they give it away at the bottom. So the people in the middle get squeezed. So, um, you know, uh, you'll get incidences whereby, you know, you're a famous artist. Like, so, OK, here's a good example. 40 years artists obviously and me was in Mona Hartoon was interviewed you know their works sell for an awful lot of money Grayson Perry was interviewed as well um 
and we insisted on paying everybody the same fee because they were putting in the same labor you know so joe de mulvey straight out of art school was putting in the same labor in that interview as anthony gormley it didn't matter that the you know obviously what they were talking about was different so everybody got the same fee and we insisted that every artist took the fee as well i mean we had incidences where artists were saying oh no i'm not i i don't need to take a fee you know and they were i will say more established artists as well you know they wanted to kind of donate it back to a n we don't really have a mechanism for donations because we're actually a company we're not a charity so that didn't work either so i just made them all take the fee because actually what i have seen in practice is that artists who are at the top of their game can very easily say okay there's a public commission that public commission probably would cost i don't know a million pounds and i should take or 500k uh, generally the kind of unwritten rule about commissions is the fee would be 10 percent and they waive their fee because they really just want the work to be there and you know they can afford to do that so they waive the 50 grand fee. That's an actual example, and I'm not going to tell you who it is. And then, of course, you've got the artist that's starting out, that's maybe having a show in uh, um, uh, an artist from space, who, who may not ask for a fee, because even though they can. And so I've seen it, it gets given away at the top and it gets given away at the bottom. And when you're in that mid-career bit, so you're trying desperately then to get paid for the work that you do it then becomes more difficult um, and so from my point of view i think if it's the same labor um, obviously with the exhibition payment guide it depends where you show so you would get more money if you show an institution with a higher turnover than an artist run space who maybe doesn't have as much turnover in uh, and and an amount that they can spend on their programs. But we, as a sector, we are our own worst enemy. If we keep giving it away at the bottom and we keep giving it away at the top, then um, it becomes very difficult then to expect to be paid in the middle. And so I don't know whether that's quite answered your question, but I think if you're as I've said, a good example was Jody Mulvey and Anthony Gormley did the same interview. They put the same preparation into it. Should you get the same money? Don't give Anthony three hundred pounds and Jody one hundred and fifty. Great, thank you, um, Julie. <laughs> I mean, that, that's answered the question. I think obviously, you know, once we get to the end of the um, the presentation, there'll be more time for kind of discussion and people to share their um, experiences, thoughts, and knowledge around the topic as well, which would be great. Um, just to add, we've got a comment here just saying, yeah, I swear I've actually never been paid above minimum wage by a gallery. So again, That's Ill it's actually illegal. It, 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 it's actually illegal to not get paid the minimum wage. So, um, yeah. And when we say an exhibition payment fee, it is literally just for showing your work. All the other stuff on top of that needs to be costed. That is literally for that work to be shown in the space, not for you to install it, not for you to, to attend the private view, not for you to have all the meetings beforehand, not for you to, to box it up and ship it there. It's literally for that work to be shown as well. Otherwise, actually, our exhibition payment guide is illegal because <laughs> if you include all that, in the, especially in the smaller payments, then yeah, you would not be getting the uh, minimum wage. So it is literally for the work to be shown, not for you to go and hang it or do any of that. So yeah, I, I've not got very many slides now. This is just some, you know, obviously with any campaign, it's good to have voices and that, you know, people recognize. Uh, so Rachel McLean was brilliant throughout and you know she was really close to it and she's really happy to be involved again so is Yinka, so is Yinka and um and many others now because obviously there really does feel like there's a groundswell but I'm really interested in that grassroots voice that's why we're working with artists leaks and you know really finding out 
Um, so just finally, we have an artist council. Uh, that's a little bit out of focus. I think Diana is also on this call um, today. And what we, um, uh, with our artist council, we're really interested in this idea of artists being leaders in their communities and being able to take some of the work that we do and really spread the word. And one of the big programs that the Artist Council initiated and did in 2020 was Artists Make Change, you know, do, do not wait for leaders, become them. Um, and I would absolutely urge you to go on to either the Earthspace Gallery website or our website. And there are a lot of in conversations with artists that you can listen to. There's some papers, there's some texts. There's also some case studies and discussion reports. I really, I really love the interviews, actually. Um, I would definitely recommend that you could go on and, and do that. And also artists, just remember the art world wouldn't exist without the artists. Uh, that's what every artist should know. And you have the power and the power belongs to you. Do not flip it around. And interestingly, when I did my Sotheby's Institute uh, lecture last week, I actually said, you know, because they're all in the kind of business of being the art business. They all want to get into the business side of it, not necessarily artists. I said, none of you have got a job if there's no artists. Nobody has. I don't have a job if there's no artists. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I know it's hard sometimes to, to feel empowered and think this way, but uh, I would urge you to do that. Um, and that's me. And um, I know that this is being recorded, but also I'll make the slides available because um, the notes in the slides, um, I've got useful links to um, different uh, things that I've talked about today. Wow, thank you, Julie. That's, um, that's really helpful and great to know that the slides will be available as well. I'll ensure that I send them by email to anyone who's attended this evening and pop it on our website as well, if that's okay. Um, and yeah, just to say thank you for compiling that presentation and for everything you've shared. And it would be great to, um, yeah, to open the floor. So if anyone um, would like to um, yeah, ask a question or has any comments, um, please, I guess, pop your, pop your camera on and raise your hand or you can pop your, um, your Zoom hand up and um, we can pass over to you. Um, Diana, if you want to kick things off, uh, that'd be great. Thank you. And then we'll, we'll move through the room. Thank you, Claire, and thank you, Julie. I think you've summed it up really well. I just want to go to talk about the um, Pay an Artist campaign. Um, I'm an Artist Council member for AN, and um, way before I joined, I saw the paper on the payment guide, and I will recommend everyone to look at that payment guide for um, Pay an Artist exhibition because it's a fantastic table. And for me, I took, I printed it out and I took it to organizations. I took it to curators. I went, this is how much I need to be paid. And it's such a concrete document. When you feel like you're just talking on your own, sometimes you negotiate and you feel like, oh, should I be asking for this much money? But I will say that paying guidement from AN is, is a fantastic document to actually go, no, this is how much I should be paid. So I do, recommend everyone to look at that and also that document says it, it indicates how much experience you have whether you're emerging whether you're mid-career whether you're a professional it's not all about big names but it's a fantastic table to fight your corner and this is how much I need to get paid so I just recommend everyone just to look at that document and that table because it is a, a backup and it really supports you just wanted to say that yeah, and I think what, what has come out, thank you, Diana, and what has actually come out of the focus groups, which I think will be great for the expansion of that document, is the unpaid labour elements. So, mm. you know, the fact that you're in your studio and, you know, that you're being asked to create up stuff and, bot, you know, send it off and, and do all this other stuff as well, which actually doesn't get looked at in those fees but also you know what would you charge for performance rehearsal concept that type of thing as well and I had a conversation with somebody a major major funder actually um, uh, it was a trust um, 
who fund they fund individual artists it was trusts and foundation and they couldn't understand why artists fees were so high you know if you're using the daily rate calculator and i actually said well if you think about it if you're an actor and you're rehearsing for a play you basically go along to a rehearsal studio somebody's provided it for you you show up you read your lines uh, you go home if you're actually preparing work for an exhibition you're paying for your studio so that's the right i said you know artists are basically the rehearsal studio you are making everything so you're you know you like the actor you know they, there's somebody else making the outfit you know the costume somebody else is making the backdrop somebody else is doing the music somebody else is sorting out the sound um for those rehearsals you're doing all of that and then she got it she said penny dropped you know she said now i understand it the artist is everything it's doing everything and i think it's also as simple as you get paid for your skill and for the job you do in any other sector any other daily job why shouldn't we as artists if you're yeah. providing a service and that came up with that site visit thing because you you know your plumber doesn't do a site visit to look and see whether your toilet needs repairing i'm, I'm saying that because my toilet does need repairing at the moment but luckily we've got two but um, but but you know he's not going to he or she's not going to show up and do a site visit and then let you know what the work is and and you know so they're not going to show up for free to do that site visit. Um, but yeah, more questions, discussion. And we've got another question um, in the chat whilst people are preparing other thoughts. Um, so this is from Bakar, and I think it's it's so thinking not just about um, I guess what's happening in in England or the UK um, or the East Midlands in this instance with regards to pay. Um, but this comment is um, it's so painful that in Ni Nigeria is a country where artists are being um, encouraged uh, are being encouraged when we talk about paying artists. So I guess that's about whether yeah, there's conversation around paying artists in other countries or areas of um, the UK even thinking about whether the conversation is taking place and how that conversation is or isn't being supported by, um, you know, galleries, organisations and um, bodies such as yourself. Yeah, no, my, um, my actual geography is going to fail me now. I do know where Nigeria is, by the way, so I'm not, not, not that kind of geography. Uh, the IAA, so the International Arts Association that I talked about earlier on in the presentation, there are organisations like um, uh, uh, like AN in different countries. There's even the equivalent of AN in Mongolia, actually. So there are similar organisations across the world, but because we have been more in partnership with Europe and Asia, I can't remember whether there is an artist association in Nigeria. I know that there's one in Ghana, but I don't know whether there's one in Nigeria. So I will look that up because often, I mean, a good example of this is I was asked to do a talk for um, uh, the Daiwa Foundation. And um, when we were discussing it, beforehand I said you do realize that there is that's a Japanese foundation by the way sorry there is the equivalent of AN in Japan and the Daiwa Foundation didn't know that so I think sometimes that 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 information is is hidden um, so I will find out for you through the IAA whether there is an uh, whether there is an equivalent of AA, a, AN in Nigeria and if there isn't that one of the things that we have committed to as an international arts association, um, both on a global level, but also in our localities, is to do mentorship around um, different parts of the world where perhaps the infrastructure is not as um, developed in terms of artists rights and those types of um, and organizations like AN. So if there isn't one there, we should basically have a conversation with the British Council because uh, Skinder actually, who's the director of arts at British Council is on our board and very committed to 
artists' rights and supporting artists and paying artists. So, um, yeah, that is possibly something. But I, I just, but it's just completely slipped my mind whether there is one in Nigeria. Thank you, Julie. And like you say, it's it's brilliant. If um, yeah, if that's something you can look up and share. I think that's um, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so we've got more questions here in the chat um, from the same individual around um, the fact that there aren't kind of residency programs necessarily in Nigeria. And then said there's that kind of, um, I guess, the, the need to have to apply for kind of international opportunities, residences, exhibitions in order to, to get that experience and to have that artist development and, um, yeah, to, to practice, basically. Yeah, I mean, we when I was at Liverpool Biennial, I didn't do the research trip, but one of the curators went on a research trip to Ghana and uh, Nigeria. Um, and so, yeah, I feel, you know, there are different levels of like the way, I mean, I know from my work as well, when I worked in Australia and working with Asia, you know, different countries have different levels of kind of infrastructure around, um, um, you know, supporting artists. So, um, and I know that in Ghana, it's, it's more developed there in terms of, you know, although a lot of it's in private hands rather than publicly funded, um, but I do, I have a friend who's an artist that's, that's in Ghana and he went back to Ghana to, to practice because he, it was just easier to do it there than, than London. Um, but yeah, I must admit, I, my knowledge uh, around Nigeria and the arts infrastructure there is a little bit low, um, but I'll certainly go back and do a bit of digging and send some info through. Thanks, Julie. It'd be great to have more info about the, the mentorship as well that you've mentioned. Um, we've got another, we've got a hand up here from InfoAt. Um, if you'd like to um, ask a question, that'd be great. Hi. Um, hi, I'm Jo Cope and I'm in my studio at the minute. So I had my camera off because I'm actually working. But thank you so much, um, Julie and team. Brilliant. Um, everything that you've said, really interesting. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask, um, what's your opinion on the loan of objects for museums? So I know you've kind of talked about institutions um, and you've also talked about galleries and I don't know whether that comes under there. Um, but yeah, my own experience is um, that generally people, you know, I create conceptual shoe objects and some will get in touch and say, we've got an exhibition, we'd like to um you know use one of your pieces part of that exhibition and there's never any fee talked about for kind of loan of object um and um one of the exhibitions i was involved with was uh, one of the major museums in paris um and it's always kind of um you know like you were saying even about preparation paying for crates you know shipments they um offered to cover shipment fees um and insurance um, and I kind of think, you know, some of the things you were talking about were really resonating in terms of artist attitudes. And I think often we're so um, grateful to be able to be visible and to be able to raise our profile that in a way that feels like the fee itself. You know, oh, thank you very much. I'd love to be involved with that. But um, if our work is forming a key part of an exhibition, in a museum what what is your opinion on I mean because I just I don't think it's never offered so I always think if I was to say is there a fee or there needs to be a fee then the I think the worry is that they will say oh, I'm sorry there isn't one which I have asked before about there's even people who won't you have to pay your own shipment which is kind of insane you're actually paying to to be part of this um but again, I've often seen it as um, a way in, you know, and a way of kind of developing exposure. Um, but, but is that something that I should be kind of challenging? Am I, you know, likely yeah. to get excluded from, from no. the opportunities? No, you should. What, what also happens in institutions is often the person that you might be dealing with, the curator, is not then the registrar. And the registrar would probably hold the budget for shipping and getting work in, getting work out, maybe uh, loan fees. Um, and so actually, as well in the exhibition payment guide, um, there are 
there is some guidance around uh, around loans and you know if you if you've got if your work is going into an exhibition it's going into an exhibition whether it's new work or whether it's already made work and also if your work goes into a collection you can actually negotiate a contract whereby every time that work gets shown so if that collection loans the work that you get a fee and in fact in with the arts council collection some artists have got um contracts where they um then also um have to be consulted on where the work's going as well and i think if you ask you'll find that most will you know because at the point where they've asked you to put your you know they want your work and they want it in the exhibition if you ask if you say here's the guidance here's my contract this is what i expect to get paid i would say probably about nine times out of ten people will just pay it you know yeah. because it you know and i think it's because we don't ask as well that actually people are not getting paid because you you know maybe you feel a bit awkward to ask or you don't know what to ask for but that's what the guidance is there for but i i'm actually going to make sure that um i'm writing a note here about loans because um yeah, I mean, I had a situation when I was in Australia that and we had an Australian artist that had put work, had had her work curated into um, a work. It was a poster exhibition, actually, works on paper, but they were all original works. And um, and they'd gone into MoMA and the registrar had got in touch with her to say that she needed to pay X to get her work back. And I said, that's ludicrous. It's mo, mo you know, it's it's moment. Of course they can send you a tube. It's a tube, you know, it's work on paper. Of course they can send a tube back to you. Um, but what was interesting about that situation is the curator had no idea that the registrar was being behaving like that because that's a whole different department. And I said to this artist, because she was clearly distressed, I said, I know like one of the curators there I'll find out whether this can possibly be true so I just emailed somebody and the curator was really shocked that this was happening and then um the work came back paid for you know it was just that's the same it's just a cardboard tube um so go on on that sorry Julie don't be afraid of writing your own contract your own yeah. requirements as well and put it into that email the worst thing that can happen is they say no put in your requirements yeah i think that's really good advice and i think the guidance note that i didn't i didn't know about the um, an guidance um payment guidance and i'm going to refer to that now and also the note that you're saying about the registrar that julie was saying also is that fact that i've realized now i've dealt that's who i've dealt with in the past and so you're not having direct contact with the curator um but yeah, and one, one other thing, um, you know, recently we had um, a meeting with um, a local council in Leicestershire and um, it was for artists to work on a particular project. And when we were online, um, the lady who was running the project just said, um, so what is that? What, what does anyone expect to get paid? And sort of just, you know, actually hadn't got any infrastructure there and just said, does anyone, would anyone want to get paid? Does anyone expect to get paid? Are you okay to do it without payment? And that was one of the things and not knowing what these payment structures are, I'm just going off of kind of uh, do lecturing at the university, I went off a lecturer's day rate because I had no other reference to go from. And I actually stood up and said, we need to get paid. There has to be a daily rate. And that has then got pushed through um, and um, there's been, they, they found the money, but they kind of said, well, we haven't got, we want to do this project with artists, but we haven't got any money. And I thought this is a council. Well, if you, if you haven't got the money, you can't do the project or you need to do it next year or you need to apply for funding. But that was a really recent experience when I had to just kind of say, yes, we need to get paid and do a ballpark figure. But I'm really thankful to um hear about this event and also to have this guidance now to reference so thank you you know all for your advice on that 
Yeah, and, and, and you know, and councils should not be uh, trying to do things for nothing because they can get all in all kinds of trouble, actually. You know, I, I've worked for I've worked for Southwark Council, Lambeth Council and Westminster City Council. And there is no way that I would have been able to uh, try and do a project. So I was head of arts and then the other two, I was an arts officer and Southwark, I was doing community arts. There's absolutely no way that you can you can do that. It's, it's illegal on, you know, in, in, in you, you can't. Yeah, and it, because it's really the old ways but, of thinking of artists are just playing. Oh, you're having fun. You're obviously not going to expect to get paid for that. You know, it's kind of this. Re I just thought it was such an old mentality. And, you know, I think what you've been saying is we have to educate. We need you to educate us and then we need to carry on and educate other people. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's because right. But yeah, it shocked they're me. subject to yeah. procurement, you know, and things like that. Councils, they, they can't they can't just like because actually it would go against like competition as well, competition and procurement. Um, yeah, thank you. That's just really... bad behaviour, isn't it? It's just shocking. Yeah, it's still <laughs> happening. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, take, all, um, take ownership. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Diana. Um, yeah, I think just to, um, yeah, to, to add to that, that kind of like you say, expectation that artists are, are playing at it, it's just, yeah it's extremely outdated and then the fact that unfortunately the artists are the individuals who are needing to be the ones kind of teaching the organizations which is a, a real shame that it's like say just more labor on the artists but um let's move over to lucy you've got your hand up go for it hi my unmute didn't work sorry <laughs> hello i'm lucy and i hi. i'm a, a freelance arts producer but i also work in an institution in uh, in Lincolnshire and um, I had this conversation today with a school who want to employ an artist. Uh, I've identified somebody for them and they wanted to have an initial planning meeting but it seemed to come as a complete shock to them that the fee would start at that point and it, it's that plumbing analogy again isn't it I just it, it's exhausting that you're still having to explain that just asking an artist to come to a planning meeting <laughs> without paying them uh even for an hour online on zoom you know i just it, it i just think there's a, a real complete lack of understanding that people aren't being paid uh to talk or to then as you say pack their work and it feels like there needs a huge level of um awareness raising because I think within the institutions and I know there are many that don't get it right and our budget's not big enough and we would love to be doing more uh, we're advocating all the time for artists to be paid properly um, but as soon as you even then step outside of that public sector the level and awareness is just drops off the edge of a cliff um, so I yeah I don't know what kind of um bbc campaign there could be you know obviously grayson's tv show was amazing and everybody watched it and it did a lot to talk about kind of the benefit of art and health and well-being and how we all took care of each other and how creativity helped people get through the pandemic so there's been a huge amount of kind of uh, spotlight on you know the value of the arts and artists through this time so it feels like it might be a really good time to you know, get a real national media campaign going that kind of looks at looks at this and those case studies that you talked about, you know, the blogs that you talked about, how many times artists get ex expected to, to do things and to start work for free and the, the loss of their intellectual property. Um, yeah, I just applaud everything you've said and I totally, totally behind it and just think that we as, you know, as the intermediaries, the curators, the producers and the, and the institutions need to just continue to do more, continue to be informed and to help them, and do, you know, work with the artists and do what we can. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I completely agree. And I think we do need to do a bigger campaign. We've got at this point, we're in this kind of we're in the sort of six months of the planning and the change and getting 
all of the information together so by the by March next year we'll have an artist payment guide and then I think the awareness raising the education and that continuous updating of that document as a dynamic document rather than something that's fixed um, is very very important and um, I have written that into our plans for 22-23 um, perhaps not on the level of the BBC, but actually what you've just said about the school there is really good because we can work through those bridge organisations, Arts Council bridge organisations, and make sure they all understand because they're the ones that are then working and putting artists into schools. I've got a question I saw from Hilke in the, um, in, in the chat, which is about Sometimes you make work for a specific exhibition, like a commission, and sometimes the work has already been made. Um, the, the difference between the two, if the work's already been made and it goes to exhibition, then you should get an exhibition payment fee. And that's straightforward, it's in the guide. With a commission, what's usually gonna be asked of you is to make new work and there'll be, uh, quite often and this is an institutional thing as well they the commissioning fee ends up being the fee to make the work and all of the other labor as well and your fee and so what you do have to do is be very careful about the commission fee because actually often those can or, or say what you can actually do for the commission fee if the commission fee can't be upped then you need to say what you can actually make or do for that um, taking off, you know, how many days it's going to take you to, you could use the AN daily rate calculator, this is how many days it's going to take me to make the work, uh, this is the material, so you can do like a proper breakdown. And then actually, when the work is being exhibited, you should get the exhibition payment fee again as well. So, because the commission fee, technically, if you haven't got a written contract, or even if you've got a contract, the commission fee is actually about making the work. The presentation of the work should be different. And if you think about like the life cycle of like an artwork, and I talk about this really more when I'm doing the fundraising side of things, it's gonna have a research and development phase, a production phase, a presentation phase, and then probably, hopefully, a distribution phase where it gets distributed more widely. And that could be anything from a tour to a catalog, you know, where your images are getting used, you know, that type of thing. So um, I, I always say with the commissioning fee, that is about the production of the work, not the presentation of the work. And so when the work is presented, you should then get the exhibition payment fee on top of it. Or at least calculate that into the commission fee and let them know that that's what you want. And if the work's already made and it just goes to an exhibition, then actually you, you, you should get the exhibition fee. And if they want you to show up to install it, and if they want you to show up to the private view, if they want you to talk about your work, if they want to show you off to some collectors or anything like that, then that you need to bill for that time. And just going on from Julia, I think it's always a good idea to give yourself a budget for all those different aspects of when you're developing your work to commission, to presenting, to distribution, give yourself a fee that you can present. Can I ask a question? <laughs> my, pro my problem is, but what is my fee? Like, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> so, so if you use the daily rate calculator, it'll give you, it'll, you just go on and put everything in and it'll spit out a fee for you. Daily rate calculator? Yeah, it's on the AM website. Yeah, if you go onto the AM website, and if you remember, actually, every time we send a member mailing, so this is on a monthly basis, we mm -hmm. um, the daily rate calculator is embedded in that mailing. We, we just like every month that goes in. <laughs> okay. But you need to be a member to get that mailing. But you can use the daily rate calculator actually without being a member because those things like the exhibition payment guide, mm -hmm. daily rate calculator, they're publicly available. 
Right, I would advise you of your CITB member for £38 a year. It's very, very good value. You get your mm -hmm. £10 million insurance, and most institutions won't let you practice. They won't let you show your work in their institution if you don't have that insurance. And I spoke to, to I did the Concord Art Prize recently, and I talked to two artists at that at the Concord Art Prize, and they were paying for their insurance through a, a completely different insurer. And they were paying, one was paying over £200 a year, and the other one, to be fair, does installation work as well, was paying mm -hmm. £400 a year. Well, it's £38. Yeah, no, £38 is not much. <laughs> it's brilliant. But, you know, also you do need to know what your daily rate is because you can't do any funding application without it. Yeah. Well, another thing is, like, at what point can I call myself an artist? Just because I create doesn't mean I'm an artist, because I don't have an artistic background. My background is in literature, actually. So, the, but I do visual um, work. Yeah, well, I can tell you now, the, um, you, you can, it's a completely and utterly unregulated market. Anybody can call themselves an artist and anybody can deem a work an artwork. What actually um, gives you the gravitas and creates your career and your professional development is what we would call mm. endorsement. And that's mm. when there is an appetite and an interest in the work that you do. Okay. And so, you know, I can't call myself an artist. I've been to art school. I've got a good degree in fine art. I can draw. I can do all, I can, I can paint, I can draw, I can even weld actually, but I'm not an artist because I'm not practicing and I'm not making artworks for somebody else to decide that that is an artwork. Okay. Um, Coming up to seven now, yes. so. Sorry, it's my clock. <laughs> Um, thank you for your question, um, Alicia. Hope that was helpful. Um, and, and thank you, um, uh, Julie, for everything that you've um, been able to discuss with the group today. Thank you, um, Diana, for your contributions as, um, as someone from the, the group there as well. And um, for everyone who's asked questions. Um, as Julie said, we, we've, hit, um, we've hit spot on seven o'clock. Um, but if there's any last minute burning questions, if not, there's going to be, um, I've been dropping some links in the chat kind of throughout some of the resources that have been mentioned, but obviously there's going to be the, the, the PDF of the presentation from today, which is going to be shared with everyone and the recording from today's session, if anyone missed anything. Um, so yeah, thank you again. And um, I guess we'll, yeah, we'll call it a night. So yes, it's very well, easy to, to feel that you. injustice, isn't it, in the system? Yeah. But you have to you have to make the system work for you, yeah. Um, to a certain extent, and we'll try our best to change it with our advocacy. So, um, yeah. But thank you everybody for joining this evening because I know thank you. it's busy times. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. bye.